Now open your question paper and look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions 1 to 8, choose the best answer. A, B or C. Question 1. You hear a TV presenter talking about making travel documentaries for TV. I love making travel documentaries for TV. I enjoy the sense of adventure and how travel and meeting other people broadens your horizons. And yet, I don't go on holiday. I don't need to. My life is a bit like a holiday, even though I'm actually really busy all the time. My father worked at a job he hated for 42 years, and I remember him saying to me, don't make the mistake I did. Find something you love and make money out of it. He was so right. I love making travel documentaries for TV. I enjoy the sense of adventure and how travel and meeting other people broadens your horizons. And yet, I don't go on holiday. I don't need to. My life is a bit like a holiday, even though I'm actually really busy all the time. My father worked at a job he hated for 42 years, and I remember him saying to me, don't make the mistake I did. Find something you love and make money out of it. He was so right. Question 2. You hear an interview with a woman talking about rowing across the Atlantic Ocean. Jeanette, you and your team have just finished rowing across the Atlantic Ocean. What are your feelings? It feels like a dream to have arrived. It truly deserves to be called the world's toughest row. We rode through a hurricane and even got attacked by flying fish. But we are so proud to have achieved something that we originally thought was way beyond our capabilities. We're the oldest team ever to have done it, but that was never an issue for us. Some of the equipment broke, which was what we were really afraid of. But hey, despite that, we made it. Jeanette, you and your team have just finished rowing across the Atlantic Ocean. What are your feelings? It feels like a dream to have arrived. It truly deserves to be called the world's toughest row. We rowed through a hurricane and even got attacked by flying fish. But we are so proud to have achieved something that we originally thought was way beyond our capabilities. We're the oldest team ever to have done it, but that was never an issue for us. Some of the equipment broke, which was what we were really afraid of. But hey, despite that, we made it. Question 3. You hear two colleagues talking about what they did at the weekend. Good break, Natasha. It was OK. You didn't spend it stuck in front of the computer like you do here in the office? I did, actually. Well, you know how hard it is for me to keep on top of my workload at the moment. It's really beginning to get me down, so a while ago I decided I needed a new job. And that's when I realised that most of them require a certificate I haven't got round to getting. So I found the perfect course that I could do online from home. Hardly a break, but at least I feel I'm in a better place now for when I do start going for something new. Good break, Natasha. It was OK. You didn't spend it stuck in front of the computer like you do here in the office? I did, actually. Well, you know how hard it is for me to keep on top of my workload at the moment. It's really beginning to get me down, so a while ago I decided I needed a new job. And that's when I realised that most of them require a certificate I haven't got round to getting. So I found the perfect course that I could do online from home. Hardly a break, but at least I feel I'm in a better place now for when I do start going for something new. Question 4. You hear an interview with a musician who is talking about being famous.
It's quite strange being famous. When people see me out and about, they often come up to talk. I use the tube like anyone else who lives in London. And nobody who sees me there tweets, why isn't he travelling by a helicopter? Because nobody thinks of me like that. People do have an image of me, though, from TV appearances I've made. It's odd to watch the edited version of yourself on TV, because I don't look or speak like that normally. There's the adrenaline rush you get when you're on stage that doesn't exist in the rest of your life. It's quite strange being famous. When people see me out and about, they often come up to talk. I use the tube like anyone else who lives in London. And nobody who sees me there tweets, why isn't he travelling by a helicopter? Because nobody thinks of me like that. People do have an image of me, though, from TV appearances I've made. It's odd to watch the edited version of yourself on TV, because I don't look or speak like that normally. There's the adrenaline rush you get when you're on stage that doesn't exist in the rest of your life. Question 5. You hear part of an interview with a writer in which he talks about the novel he has written. You have high hopes for this latest novel of yours, don't you? I do. It's got everything. Action, romance, mystery and a bit of humour. To be honest, if I don't get a phone call from a major studio in the next six months, I'll be very disappointed. <laughs> How long did you spend writing it? Compared to my previous novels, it was relatively painless. The words just flew onto the page, and I was all done in about six months. Of course, I know the main character so well by now. It, it is my third book in the series, after all. You have high hopes for this latest novel of yours, don't you? I do. It's got everything. Action, romance, mystery and a bit of humour. To be honest, if I don't get a phone call from a major studio in the next six months, I'll be very disappointed. <laughs> How long did you spend writing it? Compared to my previous novels, it was relatively painless. The words just flew onto the page and I was all done in about six months. Of course, I know the main character so well by now. It, it is my third book in the series, after all. Question 6. You hear a hotel owner talking about her hotel. Many people have commented on the customer service in my hotel. They say we're smart without being over the top, as some smart hotels are. I think that's a good summary of our whole business model, actually, of everything I believe in. From the start, we took the decision to provide terrific showers and put duvets on the beds, the very best I could find because that's the way people sleep nowadays. Those are the fundamentals, the basics. It's the same in our restaurants, good food but nothing elitist. But also, to me, real customer service means staff finding that extra 5% that sets you apart from other hotels. Many people have commented on the customer service in my hotel. They say we're smart without being over the top, as some smart hotels are. I think that's a good summary of our whole business model, actually, of everything I believe in. From the start, we took the decision to provide terrific showers and put duvets on the beds, the very best I could find because that's the way people sleep nowadays. Those are the fundamentals, the basics. It's the same in our restaurants, good food but nothing elitist. But also, to me, real customer service means staff finding that extra 5% that sets you apart from other hotels. Question 7. You hear two friends talking about a housing development scheme in their town. I love those new luxury apartments they're building in the city centre. Have you seen them? The restaurants and shops are right on the doorstep. They're a great addition to the city, I must admit. They add a bit of class to that part of town, and they do provide loads of affordable accommodation for single people and couples. They're selling a particular lifestyle, though. There's a real shortage of family accommodation in the city, and these apartments just don't address that. Mind you, at least they don't take up as much space as all those office blocks which seem to dominate the city. 
I love those new luxury apartments they're building in the city centre. Have you seen them? The restaurants and shops are right on the doorstep. They're a great addition to the city, I must admit. They add a bit of class to that part of town, and they do provide loads of affordable accommodation for single people and couples. They're selling a particular lifestyle, though. There's a real shortage of family accommodation in the city, and these apartments just don't address that. Mind you, at least they don't take up as much space as all those office blocks which seem to dominate the city. Question 8. You hear two people on a discussion program talking about the way employees dress for work. I heard that most people now believe wearing jeans into the office is acceptable. I tend to agree, although there are surely still some professions where only a suit looks presentable, however uncomfortable. <laughs> I think the issue of clothes reflects the fact that most business environments are a lot less formal these days. What's more, people are staying later and later in the office, so it's only fair that companies should allow you to dress more comfortably. With flexible working hours... Focusing on attendance or the way you look isn't considered by bosses to be that important anymore. If a job's well done, who cares if it's achieved in a t-shirt? I heard that most people now believe wearing jeans into the office is acceptable. I tend to agree, although there are surely still some professions where only a suit looks presentable, however uncomfortable. <laughs> I think the issue of clothes reflects the fact that most business environments are a lot less formal these days. What's more, people are staying later and later in the office, so it's only fair that companies should allow you to dress more comfortably. With flexible working hours, focusing on attendance or the way you look isn't considered by bosses to be that important anymore. If a job's well done, who cares if it's achieved in a t-shirt? That is the end of part one. Now turn to part two. Part two. You will hear a man called Mark Dawson talking about his visit to the Albuquerque Balloon Festival in New Mexico, USA. For questions 9 to 18, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds to look at part 2. Hello everyone, my name is Mark Dawson and I'd like to tell you about a trip I took to a hot air balloon festival that takes place every year in the United States. It's known as the Albuquerque Balloon Festival. It's held every October in Albuquerque in New Mexico. Apparently the first year it took place in 1974, it was February, but then the organiser realised that from then to April there is the possibility of bad weather so in 1975 it was moved to later in the year. The balloon festival was started by a businessman. He became very interested in balloons quite by chance. He bought a balloon for a transport company he owned, thinking it would look good in TV advertisements. He loved the experience so much, he decided to organise a ballooning event at Albuquerque. Anyway, the event is held in the desert in New Mexico, and the colours and mood of the desert were perfectly reflected in the name of this year's festival, Dreams. Last year's was called Up and Away. I was really impressed by the size of the festival when I went. It's actually the largest balloon festival in the world. The balloons varied in size from absolutely enormous ones that can carry quite a few people to quite small one- or two-person balloons. 
The colours of the balloons were amazing. The event that drew the biggest crowds of all was specifically for balloons with unconventional shapes, such as cartoon characters and even animals. Another event was called the Flight of the Nations. This is when balloons from all the countries represented at the festival take off one by one while music from their country is played. I really loved this. It was fabulous. This event alone lasted around three hours and people all around were waving flags. I was really lucky to bump into a real balloon expert who didn't mind at all when I asked him loads of questions. Apparently, one reason for the popularity of this balloon festival is something called the Albuquerque Box. It's a unique wind formation caused by the nearby Sandia Mountains and means that if a balloon rides these winds, its path forms a square. This means the pilot is able to land very near the takeoff spot. Looking at the balloons close up, you can see that the balloon part itself is made of really strong waterproof material. There are ropes that hold the balloon to the basket, and I was told that if something went wrong, you'd cut these and the basket would fall off and the balloon would turn into a kind of parachute. Not something I'd like to try. To make the balloon rise up in the air, the pilot has to make it lighter. Now, I knew that they often did this by emptying the bags of sand hung on the basket, because I'd seen that in films. What I didn't realise was that they also carry water, which they empty out of the balloon for the same reason. You can imagine that there's very little protection from the weather when you're up there in a balloon, but it's not all bad. Large balloons have a curtain that they can pull round the basket to stop the rain coming in. They can leak, but at least they keep the worst of the rain out. The second day of the festival, I got up before breakfast to go and watch 500 balloons take off. It takes a breath away to watch the sunrise as they lift off into the sky. My new ambition now is to go for a trip in a hot air balloon. I can hardly wait. Now you will hear part two again. Hello everyone, my name is Mark Dawson and I'd like to tell you about a trip I took to a hot air balloon festival that takes place every year in the United States. It's known as the Albuquerque Balloon Festival. It's held every October in Albuquerque in New Mexico. Apparently the first year it took place in 1974, it was February, but then the organiser realised that from then to April there is the possibility of bad weather so in 1975, it was moved to later in the year. The balloon festival was started by a businessman. He became very interested in balloons quite by chance. He bought a balloon for a transport company he owned, thinking it would look good in TV advertisements. He loved the experience so much, he decided to organise a ballooning event at Albuquerque. Anyway, the event is held in the desert in New Mexico, and the colours and mood of the desert were perfectly reflected in the name of this year's festival, Dreams. Last year's was called Up and Away. I was really impressed by the size of the festival when I went. It's actually the largest balloon festival in the world. The balloons varied in size from absolutely enormous ones that can carry quite a few people to quite small one- or two-person balloons. The colours of the balloons were amazing, the event that drew the biggest crowds of all was specifically for balloons with unconventional shapes, such as cartoon characters and even animals. Another event was called the Flight of the Nations. This is when balloons from all the countries represented at the festival take off one by one while music from their country is played. I really loved this. It was fabulous. This event alone lasted around three hours and people all around were waving flags. I was really lucky to bump into a real balloon expert who didn't mind at all when I asked him loads of questions. Apparently, one reason for the popularity of this balloon festival is something called the Albuquerque Box. It's a unique wind formation caused by the nearby Sandia Mountains and means that if a balloon rides these winds, its path forms a square. This means the pilot is able to land very near the takeoff spot.
Looking at the balloons close up, you can see that the balloon part itself is made of really strong waterproof material. There are ropes that hold the balloon to the basket, and I was told that if something went wrong, you'd cut these and the basket would fall off and the balloon would turn into a kind of parachute. Not something I'd like to try. To make the balloon rise up in the air, the pilot has to make it lighter. Now, I knew that they often did this by emptying the bags of sand hung on the basket, because I'd seen that in films. What I didn't realise was that they also carry water, which they empty out of the balloon for the same reason. You can imagine that there's very little protection from the weather when you're up there in a balloon, but it's not all bad. Large balloons have a curtain that they can pull round the basket to stop the rain coming in. They can leak, but at least they keep the worst of the rain out. The second day of the festival, I got up before breakfast to go and watch 500 balloons take off. It takes your breath away to watch the sunrise as they lift off into the sky. My new ambition now is to go for a trip in a hot air balloon. I can hardly wait. That is the end of part two. Now turn to part three. Part three. You will hear five short extracts in which students are talking about starting at university. For questions 19 to 23, choose from the list A to H what each speaker says about how they felt. Use the letters only once. There are three extra letters which you do not need to use. You now have 30 seconds to look at part three. Speaker 1 On my first day at university, there were a few things I did feel quite concerned about, like whether or not the other students would be the kind of people I'd get on with, but I had great faith in the fact that the course would be what I'd signed up for, and that's been the case. The work's been challenging and stimulating, and naturally there have been times when I haven't been able to follow a lecturer's argument, which is frustrating, but getting on top of things like that is what university study is all about. Speaker 2 The first day there weren't any lectures. The focus was on getting to know the other people you'd be studying with for the next few years. Although I could see the point of that, what I really wanted to do was get on with lectures, essays and things. After all, I thought that's why I was there, wasn't I? Now I'm actually glad we were given the opportunity to socialise right at the beginning. I made loads of new friends. And I needn't have worried. There's been plenty of work to do since then. In fact, I sometimes struggle to fit it all in. Speaker 3 At school I'd always had a close group of friends and we'd meet to do our homework together. I felt I needed similar support at university as I didn't feel confident in my academic ability. On my first day, I wondered whether I'd meet enough new people who were also interested in working hard, and that turned out to be the case, fortunately. A couple of my school friends were doing the same course at another university, and they encouraged me from the very beginning, telling me to believe in myself and stop thinking I wouldn't be able to cope with all the essays and so on. And sure enough, I'm finding it fine. Speaker 4 We had lectures from the very first day. We were given maps of the university, a timetable, and basically told to get on with it. I didn't find it as hard finding my way around the campus as I did having to make new friends. I kept wishing I was back with my classmates I grew up with. It took a little time for me to settle in because of that, but the first day was the worst. Luckily, I'm over it, and there are so many students here that I found plenty of people I really get on with. But I remember that first day. It was hard. 
speak of five. I'd expected there to be loads of students on my particular course, but there weren't. That was a letdown, really, but the feeling didn't last long because I went on to meet plenty of interesting people who were studying other subjects. Eventually, they became really good friends, just as close as those I'd made at school. Of course, I also got to know loads of interesting people doing other courses. It was a real buzz going from a small school in the countryside to a city university like I did. I really felt the world was opening up for me. Now you will hear part three again. Speaker one. On my first day at university, there were a few things I did feel quite concerned about, like whether or not the other students would be the kind of people I'd get on with. But I had great faith in the fact that the course would be what I'd signed up for, and that's been the case. The work's been challenging and stimulating, and naturally there have been times when I haven't been able to follow a lecturer's arguments, which is frustrating. But getting on top of things like that is what university study is all about. Speaker two. The first day there weren't any lectures. The focus was on getting to know the other people you'd be studying with for the next few years. Although I could see the point of that, what I really wanted to do was get on with lectures, essays, and things. After all, I thought that's why I was there, wasn't I? Now I'm actually glad we were given the opportunity to socialise right at the beginning. I made loads of new friends. And I needn't have worried. There's been plenty of work to do since then. In fact, I sometimes struggle to fit it all in. Speaker three. At school, I'd always had a close group of friends, and we'd meet to do our homework together. I felt I needed similar support at university, as I didn't feel confident in my academic ability. On my first day, I wondered whether I'd meet enough new people who were also interested in working hard. And that turned out to be the case. Fortunately, a couple of my school friends were doing the same course at another university, and they encouraged me from the very beginning, telling me to believe in myself and stop thinking I wouldn't be able to cope with all the essays and so on. And sure enough, I'm finding it fine. Speaker four. We had lectures from the very first day. We were given maps of the university, a timetable, and basically told to get on with it. I didn't find it as hard finding my way around the campus as I did having to make new friends. I kept wishing I was back with my classmates I grew up with. It took a little time for me to settle in because of that, but the first day was the worst. Luckily, I'm over it, and there are so many students here that I found plenty of people I really get on with. But I remember that first day; it was hard. Speaker five. I'd expected there to be loads of students on my particular course, but there weren't. That was a letdown, really. But the feeling didn't last long because I went on to meet plenty of interesting people who were studying other subjects. Eventually, they became really good friends, just as close as those I'd made at school. Of course, I also got to know loads of interesting people doing other courses. It was a real buzz going from a small school in the countryside to a city university like I did. I really felt the world was opening up for me. That is the end of part three. Now turn to part four. Part four. You will hear part of an interview with a marine biologist called Ed Shapiro, who is talking about a diving project in the Pitcairn Islands in the South Pacific. For questions twenty-four to thirty, choose the best answer: A, B, or C. You now have one minute to look at part four.
I'm in one of the most remote places in the world, the Pitcairn Islands in the South Pacific, with marine biologist Ed Shapiro. Ed, tell us what you're doing here. Hi. We're carrying out a survey of the marine environment around the islands, exploring the coral reef on the southern end of one at present. The reef here is unlike any we've come across in terms of varieties and sizes of the organisms. Compared to some areas, it's virtually unspoiled. So our aim is to obtain an idea of what oceans were like before the impacts of global warming and increased levels of CO2. In years to come, however, this area too will become exposed to these things unless something is done. Have you been diving today? I dive every day for at least two hours in the morning and afternoon. This morning's dive was fairly standard. I was down there for a couple of hours, carrying on with my work documenting the living things I saw on the reef, how they interact with each other in this particular ecological environment. I take photographs as well as recording and logging what I've seen once I'm back on deck. Is photography essential in order to record marine life? Yes. I'm learning how to use underwater cameras more effectively. They capture things words can't, though people are completely used to astonishing pictures nowadays. Cameras are one of our tools, not just for documentation, but also for getting our message across to the public. But we're always looking for new ways to do this, and it takes more than photos to wake people up. Do you ever get frightened diving? Every diver's fear is being lost at sea, which could happen if there's a sudden change in conditions. There's a strict set of safety procedures. We carry a flashlight plus a special instrument that sends out a signal. I was pretty glad I had that to connect with my colleagues the other day. The waters were choppy and the strong currents had me drifting, very scary at the depth I was at. People think sharks are the scariest thing in the sea, but they don't represent much of a threat. They're a common sight. So tell us about how your career developed. Marine biology is a competitive field and the pay isn't necessarily great. If you're thinking of becoming a marine biologist, you have to accept there's a good chance that you may not find exactly the job you want. A degree and then a doctorate are the classic route. Also, get involved with conservation organisations, all of which I did, happily. Then you could find yourself invited on an exciting expedition like this one. I was passionate about the sea as a child. The younger you start diving, the better. How do you feel being 14,000 kilometres from home? Is homesickness a problem? It could be, but the whole boat crew and I get along pretty well. There are some great people and we're all caught up in the day-to-day -day stuff, trying to maximise the benefits of our time here, an experience we may never get again. We don't have time to stay in touch with people back home. We don't forget about them, but time passes quickly. Obviously, we do have the occasional dull moment, but there's always something on the boat that needs our attention. It's an amazing place. You're obviously happy in your work, Ed. Absolutely. The clarity of the waters around these reefs means fish thrive and we've recorded several new types for the first time, always a highlight in this profession. Several journalists have reported our findings, so that means the story of this marine world's getting out there. We've done surveys of deeper habitats by dropping cameras down to 1,600 metres, revealing some really unusual creatures. Most action, though, is between 10 to 20 metres down, where the vast majority of marine life coexists together on the reef. Now you will hear part four again. I'm in one of the most remote places in the world, the Pitcairn Islands in the South Pacific, with marine biologist Ed Shapiro. Ed, tell us what you're doing here. Hi. We're carrying out a survey of the marine environment around the islands, exploring the coral reef on the southern end of one at present. The reef here is unlike any we've come across in terms of varieties and sizes of the organisms. Compared to some areas, it's virtually unspoiled. So our aim is to obtain an idea of what oceans were like before the impacts of global warming and increased levels of CO2. In years to come, however, this area too will become exposed to these things unless something is done. Have you been diving today? I dive every day for at least two hours in the morning and afternoon. This morning's dive was fairly standard. I was down there for a couple of hours, carrying on with my work documenting the living things I saw on the reef, how they interact with each other in this particular ecological environment. I take photographs as well as recording and logging what I've seen once I'm back on deck. Is photography essential in order to record marine life? Yes. I'm learning how to use underwater cameras more effectively. They capture things words can't, 
though people are completely used to astonishing pictures nowadays. Cameras are one of our tools, not just for documentation, but also for getting our message across to the public. But we're always looking for new ways to do this, and it takes more than photos to wake people up. Do you ever get frightened diving? Every diver's fear is being lost at sea, which could happen if there's a sudden change in conditions. There's a strict set of safety procedures. We carry a flashlight plus a special instrument that sends out a signal. I was pretty glad I had that to connect with my colleagues the other day. The waters were choppy, and the strong currents had me drifting, very scary at the depth I was at. People think sharks are the scariest thing in the sea, but they don't represent much of a threat. They're a common sight. So tell us about how your career developed. Marine biology is a competitive field, and the pay isn't necessarily great. If you're thinking of becoming a marine biologist, you have to accept there's a good chance that you may not find exactly the job you want. A degree and then a doctorate are the classic route. Also, get involved with conservation organisations, all of which I did happily. Then you could find yourself invited on an exciting expedition like this one. I was passionate about the sea as a child. The younger you start diving, the better. How do you feel being fourteen thousand kilometres from home? Is homesickness a problem? It could be, but the whole boat crew and I get along pretty well. There are some great people, and we're all caught up in the day-to-day -day stuff, trying to maximise the benefits of our time here and experience we may never get again. We don't have time to stay in touch with people back home. We don't forget about them, but time passes quickly. Obviously, we do have the occasional dull moment, but there's always something on the boat that needs our attention. It's an amazing place. You're obviously happy in your work, Ed. Absolutely. The clarity of the waters around these reefs means fish thrive, and we've recorded several new types for the first time. Always a highlight in this profession. Several journalists have reported our findings, so that means the story of this marine world's getting out there. We've done surveys of deeper habitats by dropping cameras down to 1,600 meters, revealing some really unusual creatures. Most action, though, is between 10 to 20 meters down, where the vast majority of marine life coexists together on the reef. That is the end of part four. There will now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I shall remind you when there is one minute left so that you are sure to finish in time. 